Here we are with Jim Hendershot again, and the next lecture is number 18, and uh, we're going to see how we can get through this to uh, discuss the machine design strategy for a three-phase induction motor. See if we can get through this. And first, so first of all, uh, I've made a, prepared a list of 23 steps that uh, uh, 23 step process to go through. Uh, uh, the uh, design of a machine. Uh, I'm not going to read every one of them here. You can study them yourself. But uh, basically, after sizing, we uh, we make some basic decisions about the pole numbers and uh, and uh, the rotor diameter, and we'll use accepted charts uh, for that or standard practices for that, and, uh, and then we'll go through these steps to. Uh, determine each particular aspect of, uh, of uh, sizing and de going through the details of the machine. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing we have to do is to size steps one and two. And uh, this is based on the power factor desi de desired and efficiency re desired. So we start with the stator OD. <clears throat> and we uh, already provided these machine listings of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, rotor diameter versus the stator diameter depending on the number of poles and uh, uh, however most induction motors are going to be four pole machines unless uh, we're going to design real big ones so there's a uh, relationship between the uh, d to l ratio the diameter of the rotor to the length and that's uh, uh, a little plot here you could pick uh, some ratios on to start with based on the number of poles uh, Here's the repeated list again of the uh, suggested torque per rotor volume and gap stress sizing guidelines. You can uh, decide which enclosure you're going to have and, and, and shoot for one of these for sizing purposes. And, and then uh, here's uh, some uh, material that was developed by Professor Tom Lippo at University of Wisconsin, which you'll find very useful for sizing. And this gives you some uh, power factor expected power factors for different horsepower ratings and and number of poles number of poles relates to the frequency of course in accordance with the formula at the bottom there and then the uh, <coughs> the plot on the right allows you to select uh, some goals for efficiency uh, these are all based on 60 Hertz but it's still good for comparison purposes there again the speeds are listed there uh, but that depends on the uh, number of poles and the, and the 60 hertz again, so you can use that to help size. Then uh, my favorite way of sizing machines is to uh, get a, to, as a starting point at least, is to get these data sheets from other uh, high-performance motor manufacturers that make elements, rotor and stator components or elements for... Uh, for machine tool spindles, high performance machine tool spindles, this is an excellent way. And I'm uh, including here that list of uh, dimensions for a different, For th this is for four pole machines here. And one of the other, uh, in the sizing uh, lecture, there, there's more of these data sheets provided. Oh, oh here we've you've got the six pole repeated here and the eight pole here. So these are the same ones. Now, for steps uh, three, four, and five, we need to determine the air gap length, the number of stator slots, and the turns per phase. The, uh, the air gap length should be as small as possible, but also it's got to be practical for manufacturing. But, uh, uh, of course, you can uh, start off by using the air gaps from, uh, from that list on the preceding slide. That's a very good place to start. Or the alternative to that is... Uh, is is if you happen to work for a large company like uh, like ABB or something like that, you already have that data. You already have the uh, typical air gaps per versus rotor size. And if you don't have that data, I, I'll, I'll iterate again, I'll mention it again, that you should uh, uh, go through all your existing machines and make tables of all these uh, these various sizing parameters from the, from the database of motors that you've built and tested and successfully uh, shipped and, and sold and been performing as expected over the years. You should build your own database for these accepted norms for the uh, 
the air gap density torque per unit volume, the actual dimension of the air gap, the length to D ratio, power factors, all of those parameters that I've given you charts for. Develop, I encourage you to develop your own charts. And state of slot selection, uh, uh, there's nothing wrong but it, the, with it being based on uh, past practices, as long as you understand that the, the some of the old rules for the rotor combination could be ignored because you're uh, driving the motor with an inverter rather than fixed voltage and frequency from the grid. The turns for phase is based on the machine size, of course, the current available, and then NI required to produce the ampere turns, uh, required to produce the gap flux density of about 0.85 Tesla in the air gap. Uh, with respect to the air gap, larger air gap increases the required magnetization. Magnetizing current goes up, so this reduces the efficiency, reduces power factor. Uh, but if you get the gap too small, uh, you can have rotor to stator uh, contact, so that must be uh, avoided at all costs. But but the uh, that's determined by really the rotor bearing system. If the bearings are preloaded and uh, if they all uh, are mounted with the right fits. Uh, it's standard practice in machines that the shafts rotate, therefore uh, the inner race of the bearings should be an interference fit on the shaft and should be loose in the stator, and the, but the stator, uh, uh, or the outer race of the bearings uh, that are mounted in a stator loose, they need preload the front bearing. These are mechanical points that we'll probably mention again in the mechanical section, but the, uh, the front bearing, the bearing in the motor that supports the load, gear loads, belt loads, pulley loads, coupling loads, anything like that, uh, many times that bearing needs to be uh, clamped. The outer race needs to be clamped so it can't skid in the outer race and gall out the bearing bore, particularly if the end bell is aluminum instead of steel. Uh, but standard gap practices are recommended. Uh, and and same, same with these other uh, factors, uh, use uh, practices for all the manufacturing tolerances, magnetizing current, pulsation losses, side loads, support for shafts, and um, the air gap thickness does not seem to significantly affect audible noise, noise in most cases, but sometimes it does. Uh, here's uh, Lippo's method and Say's method for uh, empirical air gap calculations. You can use this method. Uh, and, and in my opinion, this same uh, uh, method should apply for RSMs as well. That hasn't been proven for sure, but I can't think of any reason why it isn't applicable. Think, think of any reason why it isn't. The phase for current requirements are given by uh, these formulas. They can be calculated. The volts per phase in the stator and the total flux in the stator is calculated with this. And the air cap flux density to achieve uh, your 0.85 Tesla or 55,000 lines per square inch and of course there's a formula for total flux. The NI, the amp return requirements per pole to send the flux across the air gap is given by this formula here and the uh, amp returns per pole to magnetize the circuit that's that's uh, that's not for the air gap that's the amp returns required to magnetize the iron itself and it's a sum of the of the amp returns required for each part of the circuit. So uh, this uh, next formula here is for the effective magnetizing current per phase. The turns per coil is determined by the voltage, the power, and the current. Turns per coil varies directly with voltage. The higher the voltage, the more turns you have. The fewer, the lower the voltage, the the fewer turns you have. If you double the voltage. If, if you want to change one volt, change a winding from one voltage to the other, if you double the voltage, you double the number of turns, and you uh, and you go to th uh, three wire gauges finer. That gives you the same cross section of copper. Three wire gauges finer, and double the turns per coil. That doubles the voltage. Of course, the opposite of that is true. If you want a half the voltage, you have to go to three gauges fatter wire and reduce the number of turns by two, or by half. Divide by two. Uh, here's the formula to uh, calculate the uh, uh, flux per pole. So from that, you calculate the turns per coil. Uh, 
Uh, now there's some difficulty sometimes in picking the right number of turns, so here's some strategies for that. Sometimes uh, less than a single turn per coil is required, uh, uh, so parallel circuits, parallel circuit paths are are effect, can be effectively used for that. For example, let's say that uh, uh, with one current path, you you've calculated that you need uh, four and a half turns per coil, but you can't get four and a half turns per coil. You can only put in four or five if all the coils are in series. But if you use two parallel paths and nine turns per coil, since you're cutting the current in half, that's effectively like four and a half turns per coil. So, so uh, uh, another example is one turn per coil. If you go to two, that's too many turns, but one turn's not enough. So if you use three turns per coil and two parallel paths, that's equivalent to one and a half turns per coil. So uh, another way to get half turn adjustments is to put the neutral connection on the opposite end of the stator. So each coil has one of the turns that only goes down one side of the of the coil. It never returns because the it uh, it's connected in in a neutral connection with the half turns of of the uh, of the other phases. So this, in effect, is a half turn adjustment method. Also, it, you get an additional advantage of this that the bulk of the neutral connections aren't are, aren't uh, in the same end turn bulk where the lead connections are. You kind of <coughs> take that bulk and move it to the opposite end of the stator. Now these comments apply to all machine types discussed in these lectures. Uh, step 6, 7, 8, and 9 determine the slot to two dimensions, the slot depth and the density of current and flux. And this is simple arithmetic to, once you know what the flux is, to uh, to uh, divide the total lines of flux by the cross section just to make the tooth and the yoke dimensions thick enough so that you have the acceptable uh, flux densities in those sections. Um, now the the current densities, we've got to figure out what the current densities are. We've given this uh, plot before and uh, so you uh, here's some uh, accepted practices for current densities in the conductors. Uh, and this assumes if you have parallel paths, this assumes that the current is split evenly between all the conductors, and it doesn't always do that. So those are some serious problems of forcing uh, current equal current sharing through parallel paths. Uh, uh, now, now as I as I I presented this in an earlier tutorial, but here's some uh, uh, flux density guides that are different than the ones that I use. The, this is lipos and says. I'll point out again that lipples are more related to inverter-driven motors and says are related to grid motors. Uh, steps 10 and 11, uh, calculate the phase coil, the, the coil in each phase, the mean turn length, so you can use that to multiply times the number of turns times the number of coils per phase to get the phase resistance. Now, it's, you can measure it when it's all done to validate this and to check the accuracy of your method. So what you do is you determine the mean mean turn length of, a, of the center of the bulk of wire for each turn uh, from one stator slot to the other. Uh, you, you imaginary mean turn length so that all the turns, you'll have the accurate resistance if all the turns, uh, one smaller than that, will balance out to one bigger than that if you calculate the mean turn length. So you multiply the mean turn length times the number of turns per coil times the wire gauge resistance per inch or millimeter or meter and from this you come up with the resistance of each coil multiply that times the number of coils in the phase and uh, and so you have the uh, uh, the phase resistance unless you have some of the coils in parallel then you have to uh, uh, add the reciprocal of the coil resistances that are in parallel to come up with an equivalent uh, phase resistance. Uh, use a combination of series and parallel coils from Ohm's law to determine what it is. Now here's here's a pictorial view of how, how we determine the mean turn length and you can do this graphically and that, that's why these scaled layouts of motors are so important because you can get all this right from the scaled layout of the motor that we started these designs with earlier. Uh, you can make these sketches by hand on draft paper, or you can uh, do it through uh, a computer CAD systems. And uh, so, so from this, you determine the length of each segment of that, and uh, 
and that's your mean turn length, multiply that times the number of turns, you have the total length of wire per coil and times the resistance per meter and, and so on. And here's, uh, we include a list of uh, wire gauges, AWD chart with the, the diameter solid wire and uh, the resistance uh, in ohms per meter at 20 degrees C. And by the way, the resistance changes with temperature. Uh, you can calculate the resistance at max temperature as well. Uh, uh, steps 15, 16, 17, the rotor bar t details the number of them, the shapes and the resistance of the bars in the end rings. Uh, the number of rotor bars and shape must be based on minimizing leakage inductance and, and minimizing the cage resistance. Ignore the old rules and, uh, and just you have to have the minimum cage resistance to have the lowest copper or rotor losses as possible. And we want the minimum leakage inductance, so we have the highest power factor possible and the highest efficiency possible. The number of bars sh should be in the range of five to seven bars or, and slots per pole. For uh, uh, poles, uh, pole numbers greater than four may make it seven to nine bars per pole. But for four pole machines, uh, six, five, six, or seven bars per pole is, is a good place to start. To minimize leakage inductance, position the rotor bars as close to the OD as possible. Don't allow gaps in the OD because you'll get uh, uh, leakage uh, flux to go across those gaps and you won't link the, uh, the flux won't link the stator flux. Bar shapes can be parallel sided for large machines or tapered like uh, uh, teardrop shapes for smaller machines. Double bars should not be used for inverter driven induction machines. Use of copper bars and end ring permits lower cage resistance. Uh, that's, I think, personally, that's very important to use copper bars instead of aluminum every place you can for inverter driven machines for high performance. Uh, but bar retention and stability is a very important factor. We're going to talk about that later in another lecture on rotor design. but. Uh, uh, those those bars have to be stable in there and not move around or it makes noisy motors it can cause fatigue and bar failure if they move too much and and finally it changes balance if they move around and uh, this can cause motor failure rotor leakage uh, as a function of a rotor slot shape here's a uh, a, uh, a plot uh, that was uh, I think this is in uh, in uh, this came from Lippo's book, I believe. Suggested rotor slot proportions that can be here very helpful for design. And uh, uh, here's some bar shapes. Uh, that double bar went up there at the top. There is no good. You never want to use that. These are the typical bar shapes we'll use for inverter-driven machines. And uh, <clears throat> Uh, the cage resistance calculations can be calculated by uh, simple arithmetic means as well. You need the resistivity, aluminum or copper, depending on what the material is, and divide the bar number by the number of poles for the bar resistance of the bars that are used for each pole, and then you use the bar cross-section to calculate the, the bar resistance. The end ring cal calculation is a little trickier to get but a little common sense will figure out where the, the paths go for each uh, pole. Uh, and, and from uh, the North Pole bars to South Pole bars, you can see where the arrows go into the board and out of the board to, to form the poles and then uh, get the, the end turn length across from uh, the, the center of, uh, of that uh, bar pole group to the North Pole to the South Pole, or to the dot dots and the X's, and and then use the thickness of the bar or the end ring, and uh, as one dimension, and the uh, uh, the path length is the other. So you got your cross section that the current's going to go through, and that's an average because it's not as clear cut as being a wire. It's a it's kind of a pie shaped uh, thing that carries the <clears throat> the current. Uh, <clears throat> I, I uh, favor making the end rings a little extra thick to serve to make sure that the current density end rings a lot lower than it is in the bars. That makes the end rings run cooler, and that that if the 
if the resistance is lower, it's going to run cooler. If the current density is lower, it's going to run cooler. So that's going to act as a heat sink and suck the uh, heat that, that are formed from the ohmic losses from the bars out to suck them out from the center out towards each end into these end rings which are spinning in the air and some of them even have fins on them so that'll help cool. Have the flux density in the end rings low. Use a little extra material make the bars thicker. What's wrong with that? And uh, sometimes in high speed machines steel end rings are added to the copper end rings to use for balance and rotor stability. Uh, you have to balance these rotors so you don't want to take material away from the cross section of the end rings to achieve balancing. So machine tool spindles will add a steel plate onto the end of the copper with the with the rotor bars going through the steel as well. Uh, now we, we talked about field weakening before but that's uh, this is the same data that I presented in the last slide and it's basically here to know me when we're to tell me when we're finished so and it's important I do repeat some of the slides but they need to be repeated uh, in certain topics because they're relevant to more than one topic and a lot of the topics overlap in these lectures anyway so that's the end of this lecture thank you very much oh by the way uh, steps 17 through through uh, 23 are covered in lecture 22 now we're finished <laughs>